All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, we got a great card coming up, Deerfoot Inn and Casino in beautiful Calgary, Alberta. It goes Saturday, September 28th, and we've got an awesome card from Dakota Fight Night, and I've got Michael Short, and I've got the promoter on the show to talk a little bit about that. So how's your day going so far there, man? Hey, you know what? It's Friday, and I'm on your show about to talk boxing, so let's do it. Yeah, it's always a good time for sure. And I mean, just a well-rounded card, some familiar faces for sure. And one of those warriors definitely is Devin Reddy, and he's going to be in there against Brian Samuel. So I'm kind of curious how this fight came about, like when the dialogue for Brian Samuel versus Devin Reddy kind of initially started rolling. Well, I, I think about the time that, you know, Brian, he's taken 14 months off from the sport and he had a few losses in a row. And then he came back and he fought out in D.C. And he kind of reinvented himself. You know, he fought a guy with over 30 fights. And uh, in my opinion, I think he uh, probably deserved uh, at least a draw in that fight. So, you know, it seemed that he the rest did him some good. He was in good shape. And uh, he had nothing to lose. He went for it. And, uh, he, yeah, he, he did amazing. So, um, Devin's coming off of... Uh, a long layoff. He had a little bit of a, a muscle imbalance problem that he had to work through. It, it started uh, before the Flavio fight, and it continued after, and so he solved that issue now. And uh, this is the perfect fight for uh, for both guys at this uh, this time. So, yeah, for sure. I didn't know about the muscle imbalances that Devin was going through, though. I mean, that kind of makes sense, all things considered, though, just with the layoff and everything. Yeah, you know, he uh, leading up to the Flavio fight, it was scheduled for eight rounds. And in the gym, his right shoulder would give out uh, after about four or five rounds. So, um, you know, he, he, he knew that uh, his jab and his boxing uh, IQ would get him through the fight no matter what. But it ended up uh, taking, taking out uh, Flavio in three rounds uh, decisively. So... It was all good, but uh, it's just one of those things that he had to work through uh, with his uh, uh, physio and strength and conditioning coach, and uh, I think it's all solved now. So, Yeah, and I mean, it seems like Devin kind of launched himself into this certain rarefied air just with that you know, Flavio Michel victory there and everything. It seems like he's kind of in conversation to contend for some pretty notable Canadian hardware going forward. Is that sort of the goal for maybe like, early 2020 is that something you'd even be looking for for like the november card like kind of situating devin in that kind of like a championship type of fight like where are you at on that kind of timeline well you know we've we've made a couple offers to uh, some of the, the higher level guys out east and you know like they're at a certain point in their career too that if they're going to take chances and come fight in the guy's hometown and and you know do stuff like that, they want to get paid so they you know sometimes they're price themselves out of the market so they they price too high um sometimes it's uh, it's okay so you know yeah we definitely like to negotiate and uh, put put on a title fight again we haven't done so since our first couple of events and it just didn't make sense but uh you know devin's at the point where he's gonna start looking at uh, uh canadian title north american title type of uh, level and not just the the hardware but the actual level of competition. So uh, keep in mind, we got Devin when he was 8-0, and his, uh, his initial coach and promoter that was catering to him just you know uh, didn't really have a firm grasp on what to do with Devin. Uh, in fact, Devin had more boxing uh, pedigree and IQ than the coach did. So he, uh, he it took him a little bit of time to catch up to his record, and he's working with Doug Carter now on uh you know fighting like a pro so the other guy just didn't know how to transition him from amateur boxing to pro boxing so he was fighting like an amateur but just going the longer longer Mm -hmm. distance that's all but he's getting there now and i think that shows like how invaluable having like a good person in your corner like that is just someone who's you know well read with the game and just has like a nuanced read on a lot of these situations whereby they can make that appropriate transition from amateur to pro so i mean i mean i'm glad that devin is you know catching up with all that but i mean to the point of like the title fights we were talking about i think you guys have really done a great job at like just cultivating like a core base of fighters that people are interested in checking out and i think devin an example of that but another example would be 
Candy Wyatt. I mean, she's on the heels of contending for a world championship and making history in a different country. And now she's kind of back in the familiar area of Deerfoot Inn and Casino, and she's got a big fight coming up against Diana Gonzalez. So I'd love to talk about that fight a little bit, too. Yeah, you know, the the, the culture that we're breeding here is uh, making boxing a thing in Calgary. And uh, second, uh, well, th- third event in a row, we're sold out before the show starts, which is really good. And it's uh, unusual for Calgary fight fans, but, you know, we're sold out. We're going to have uh, uh, standing room only tickets released on uh, fight night by the casino. And that's it. But, uh, yeah, Candy White, you know, she came to us. Uh, I think she had a 2-0 and record. We uh, kept her busy. And in a short period, she was 8-0. and She was fighting live girls. These, you know, whether the record was upside down or undefeated, it didn't matter. Candy was fighting uh, live opponents, and they all uh, were pushing her and giving her the rounds. And uh, she got the world title bid in Greece, and it didn't go her way. You know, she got KO'd in the sixth round. And uh, now she's back, going to shuffle the deck a bit, and uh, she's got to reinvent herself. So if you remember the fight that she had with Lincer Ortiz, Ortiz had a, an upside-down record. I think she was 2-7 and seven or something like that, but she pushed Candy to the limits. And, uh, you know, Candy uh, squeaked out a close decision over her. I think the scorecards were four, four rounds to two. Um, Diana Gonzalez comes from Baja, California, and she's, uh, she's got the similar style to Ortiz, but she's got a winning record. And, you know, it's a good fight for Candy to come back. She's had a six-month rest, but we're not giving her a soft touch. She's the main event, and she's going to have to uh, fight a live live opponent. Yeah, for sure, and that's always been something that I've appreciated about checking out the shows you guys have put on. There's no sense of, like you're giving someone like a feed or opponent or like an easy sort of bounce back. I definitely agree with that sentiment. I think this fight lends itself to being, you know, pretty action heavy and I could see both like really bringing their a game to this one. Yeah. You know what? You got to put on good, compelling fights. I mean, sometimes uh, we've had first round knockouts, but they, they were deserving. And, uh, you know, sometimes we've had fights that we expected to be, uh, barn burners and they were, you know, a, a little soft and a little <laughs> uneventful, but um, we've had upsets. You know, the local hero has been upset uh, on a couple of times. Uh, Alvin Tam and Gwen Lewis got upset, you know, from their Mexican opponents. And uh, of course, you know, we want to put on more uh, bigger events, grander events. We want to do title fights and all that kind of stuff, but we're building slowly. We operate, you know, solely on our own financing and the shows are paid for by uh by ticket sales there's, uh, there's no sponsorship advertising no ad buys nothing and um you know we get a huge sponsorship from the deerfoot casino uh which is fantastic for us and uh, we have an exclusive partnership with them so it's a it's a great deal we have with the deerfoot Indian casino and they understand business and they understand, you know, the need for keeping boxing alive in this city because Dakota is the last pro professional uh, promoter in Calgary. Everybody else has uh, gone away or gone out of business. Yeah, you guys put on top notch shows for sure. And you mentioned Deerfoot Inn Casino. And I really just like the overall vibe of that venue because it's got this like intimate kind of like pressure cooker kind of a feel like a lot of people you know are kind of like packed into this space and it just has like maybe a different vibe than like a certain like arena sort of feel do you feel like that kind of like surrounding stimuli lends itself to how the fighters perform and maybe gives like you know that much more of an impassioned performance because there's that pressure cooker kind of environment oh for sure you know they feed off the energy of the crowd right i mean we've never had a dull moment at one of our events people go nuts Uh, they're well behaved mind you they're dressed up in suits and fur coats and hats and you know (laughs) we got politicians in the crowd and uh, a lot of iconic business uh uh business owners in uh, calgary in the crowd and uh it's just uh it's a fabulous night of entertainment beyond just the boxing. I mean, we have a lot of stuff that goes on in between uh, bouts and uh, the start of the show and the show. And uh, they say the devil is in the details, and that's what we cater to. You know, we make it a a great night of entertainment. And um, 
people are coming out uh, that are non-fight fans. They just want to see a show. They want to see an event and, and have fun and loud music and sights and sounds and, you know, just fabulousness. Like uh, Liberace, Elvis Presley, and the Kentucky Derby all on the same day. No, that's a great way to put it for sure, but you mentioned Gwyn Lewis in there and the fact that he's trying to rebound from a bit of a setback in his own right. He's facing Jesse McMillan, and I think that's an interesting fight, especially with, you know, Gwyn kind of having his own sort of hiatus. I've noticed he hasn't fought throughout 2019 at any point yet. So what are your thoughts on this fight between Lewis and McMillan? Yeah, you know, going into Gwyn's last uh, fight against uh, Harrison Escobar, uh, he was facing a 5-5-3 five, five and three guy, but a very live opponent. You know, the guy comes from Mexico City. He's very uh, well-schooled and uh, well-trained. But it was a fight that we expected Gwyn to win, and he just uh, he dropped the ball. You know, mentally, he wasn't uh, prepared for the fight. He, uh, he had a lot of work commitments, and, you know, work is his number one thing in life, and boxing is, you know, uh, more like a hobby. So he, he's been off this whole year because of work, and uh, now coming into this fight, he's fighting a guy with 11 fights, but he's got an upside-down record. One win, eight losses, and two draws. But when you really go behind the numbers, you look at Jesse McMillan. This kid never had an amateur fight in his life. He learned on the job, and he's fought all the top prospects in Canada. And sometimes, you know, when a guy fights in another guy's hometown – and he gets a draw or loses, you know, a close decision, like, you know, a majority or split decision or whatever. Those are pretty much mean that he, that he won that fight. They just, you know, a little bit of nepotism went to the local fighter. So when you look at, at Jesse's record, he really could be a legitimate six wins and five lost fighter. And, you know, the five losses were for sure losses. You know, either he lost every round or he got uh, TKO'd. So... But when you're fighting guys with you know over 100 amateur fights, uh, national team members, etc., uh, that goes a long way to get a draw with those guys in a pro boxing fight. So uh, Jesse McMillan is now part of a, an actual team. He feels good. He's got a club behind him. He's got teammates. He's got people coming to watch him fight. And you're going to see the best possible Jesse McMillan that there's ever been because he, he feels different now and, and he's excited to fight on a Dakota show. That's what we hear a lot from fighters and managers and coaches that they are really excited to fight on the show. We get it from the kickboxing community and boxing. So, Yeah, and I think it shows that like a fighter's record isn't necessarily indicative of like what they bring to the table as a fighter, even though it probably should be reflective of that. But like you said, a guy like Mac Millen, if you actually look into his record, you see all of the prospects and all of like maybe like the local favoritism with the judging. But then conversely, you could see a guy who's got like this unblemished record, but he's fighting guys who maybe aren't of like the best caliber, we'll say. Well, it happens all the time. You know, it's funny. Lou DiBella is a pretty good level uh, promoter in the States. And he has a recent video out where he's talking about that. And, and he says, look, I can make a ham sandwich 15 and 0. <laughs> People don't realize like uh, how precious, you know, a good matchmaker is. And when you're thrown to the wolves and, and you're just, you know, you're the TBA guy to be announced. So you just go into guys' hometowns, you fight on short notice, you fight above your weight, below your weight, whatever, you know, what, what it means is, um, there's a lot of legitimate undefeated records out there, but then there's a lot of guys that uh, I'm not going to use the word getting exposed, but you know, they come up through the ranks and they're undefeated 12 and 0, 15 and 0. And then they appear on, you know, ESPN or something like that. And they're fighting a kid from Brooklyn who's seven and five. All of a sudden they get demolished in the first round. And then Teddy Atlas would jump up and say, who did they fight? Who did they fight? Yeah. And that, that's what it means. You know, remember the movie Rocky, and Mick was telling Rocky, they were setups, Rock. They were setups. When he's trying to explain, you know, all of Rocky's uh, uh, victories that he made uh, post Apollo Creed, uh, going into the Mr. T fight. So, and that's you know, sometimes that happens in boxing, right? Guys get catered to a little too soft. Uh, we do our best uh, to make a uh, make it a fair fight, but we also want to give our local guy you know, the odds on favorite by bringing a fighter here to fight him rather than going to that guy's hometown and fighting. We bring the guy into town. So if it starts off as a 50, 50 fight, 
we hope by the time they get here, they breathe mountain air. Uh, maybe they don't like the hotel. Uh, maybe the food is different. You know, maybe that sways your odds to 55, 45 by the time the fighter gets in the ring. And sometimes that's what you need. Like I said, you look at our past history and you see the amount of competitiveness on the fights and uh, the amount of bouts that actually go the distance on our shows rather than first and second round knockouts. So it's it, it, matchmaking is an art. You got to really know the fighters, you got to know the styles, and you got to find benchmarks as you digest their records. And so once you find a benchmark of somebody that you recognize, you can tell how competitive the fighter is going to be. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And some of these other fights here, I'm checking out. We've got Brie Howling getting ready to make her debut, taking on Claudia Vargas Ramirez, which is an interesting looking fight there. And it's looking like it's kicking off the card there and everything like that. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on this particular bout? Well, interesting enough, because, you know, my commission, uh, Shirley Sunzi, is doing her homework. And she called me out on a couple of these fights, you know, uh, questioning the validity and the competitiveness of them. And what you got to look at is Brie Howling comes from a amateur Muay Thai background. And she was a C-class amateur fighter. She's fighting a girl from, uh, 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 what do you call it, Mexico City. Mexico City has very stiff competition in the gym and in the ring. Claudia Ramirez is zero wins with four losses. But she's had four pro bouts. And she's got an amateur record of nine wins and five losses in Mexico City. So she's a live opponent. If you digest her record and you see who she's lost to, some of the girls, you know, like U.S. national champions, two and zero, three and zero. She fought a lot of undefeated records in the in the four losses, and some of these girls remain undefeated as professionals. So Bree's got her work cut out for her, but you know we don't. I've never seen her fight, so this is a little bit of the problem. I don't know where to start her. So we've got to find somebody that we just think that maybe makes a good matchup. There's no video. And I, I see the fight being incredibly competitive. And I think Brie, um, you know, she's an incredibly fit girl. She's got uh, uh, a good team behind her. And I'm expecting her to, uh, to have a tough four-round fight. But, you know, I think she'll be victorious. And that's a good way to enter pro boxing is going the full four rounds, seeing what it feels like to get hit with the small gloves, no headgear, and in front of a, a live crowd like that. Yeah, for sure. Just like really getting out there and getting your reps in. But I was kind of curious about this because I'd seen some initial advertisements for the card kind of talking about how we've got that uh, Cassie Warbeck fight for the Muay Thai Flyweight Championship. But then I saw Candy was situated as the new main event. Is that... Is that Muay Thai fight still looking to be on this card? Is that something maybe you guys would be looking to put on the upcoming November card? Like, where are we at with the WKA Flyweight Championship? Yeah, you know, we were excited uh, to host a world uh, Muay Thai title. And um, Cassie Warbeck is a heck of a fighter. Uh, her and Cam uh, Megan Cameron stole the show on a recent Dakota uh, event. They were the undercard. And it was, you know, a lot of people thought it was fight of the night. Uh, Cassie got a, a pretty severe injury in training, something that would take her out of this fight for uh, September 28th. But um, I don't think we're going to see that match made uh, for November, but we're looking for it in early 2020. So we're looking to book our schedule right now with the Deerfoot Casino and uh, make our, you know, our firm dates for next year. And then, of course, we leave a couple uh, possible openings for other events that we can put together so might be in calgary might be outside of calgary so you know we are going in lethbridge december 7th as well so we're putting together an old-fashioned club card a lot of mma fighters uh, fighting each other in boxing matches uh, pro and amateur and we'll even have some k1 style kickboxing on that card as well yeah, and you guys do a great job of mixing in like different martial arts disciplines like that. Always a fun time to check out some K1 kickboxing while some pro boxing is going on too. But one last fight I wanted to touch on here that I'm noticing is Jordan McNaughton taking on Vinen Vadavalu. And that's like an interesting fight in there in the super lightweight ranks there. You know, 2-0 and fighter going in there and, you know, getting things rolling. So what are your thoughts on that particular bout? Just kind of like touching on the last bout. Yeah, you know, Jordan is 2-0. and He's had a... a, a really good uh, 
uh, welcome into pro boxing. You know, we brought in some decent level competition, and uh, he got them out of there. Uh, I think the first fight was second round knockout. For uh, second fight was first round knockout. So, um, Jordan's got a pretty good amateur pedigree too. He's been in boxing for uh, quite some time, and uh, but he's fighting uh, Vanin Vetevalu, who comes with a really deep amateur pedigree. He's a six-time provincial champion in Manitoba. He's won the Western Canadian National Championships. He's a uh, uh, national Golden Glove champion in 2013. And he's won a silver medal in the Ringside World Championships. It's a, a tournament that took place every year in Kansas City. It was a week-long tournament with six rings going at once. And they went from morning till night. They had thousands of competitors there. And, you know, Vanden came out with a silver medal one year. So although he's 0-1 and one as a pro, he got put in too deep in his pro debut. And, he, you know, he fought a couple of years ago. He fought a top American prospect. Um, and he got TKO'd. But I don't think we're going to see a stoppage in this fight. I think it's going to be a very aggressive fight from start to finish. And it could go either way. I think on paper, uh, it looks like uh, it's for Jordan just because of the record. But when you know the the pedigree of both fighters, um, I think it's a 50-50 fight all the way. Yeah, and those amateur fighters who've got like the extensive experience there, they always seem to be like supremely technical, and they definitely they they definitely know some tricks to make it an interesting fight for sure. And you know, a very interesting card all around. But you've been great with your time, man. I'm curious if there's anything you'd like to add as a parting thought as we're wrapping up here, though. Well, you know, it, it's stuff like this, Dylan, that helps make boxing a thing. The more people that are covering it, you know, I'm a character on Sportsnet Radio, the Fan 960, Mr. Boxing of Calgary. I now write a column in the Calgary Sun called Mr. Boxing YYC. And a few years ago, uh, these two wouldn't even look at us unless we were spending advertising money with them. And it just shows you that boxing is really uh, moving to the forefront. Uh, it's getting exciting again. Dakota has kept it alive in our city. And I think eventually people will really know that we're here so the more uh, amateur fighters that come out of the woodwork and say hey i want to turn pro similar to jordan mcnaughton Bree howling um we've even uh, been in talks with a rashi doe fighter up in uh, sherwood park tim lowe who's a fantastic muay thai fighter and he wants to uh, do a little pro boxing so the more that that happens the more exciting it is for us and we're building a culture here so I just thank guys like you that uh, help uh, uh, get the word out and talk boxing and show that it's happening, and this is exciting for us, so thank you. Oh, no problem, man. I mean, it's really exciting to follow along with what's happening in the Calgary fight scene. Like, it's like a really rich, fertile sort of scene in a lot of ways, so it's great to be part of it in some sort of small way. I appreciate that sentiment, man. Yeah, and you know, Calgary has a rich history of boxing, but it disappeared at a high level for decades and uh you know we're starting to do something with it and i think people are, are are tuning in and you know our goal was to always uh attract the non-fight fan the soccer mom the hockey mom we call them and uh we're doing that so oh yeah you get people of all stripes at your shows and it's a lot of fun and people should get in on that deerfoot inn and casino is where they can do that and it goes saturday september 28th a great show put on by dakota and just really appreciate all the insights there michael and best of luck with what is presumably going to be another great show right on thanks man till the next one